I get very uh, um, shaky anymore before I preach. I've been doing it for more than 50 years. You'd think that I would be used to it by now, but I'm not. And I think today I have those feelings because I don't really know how many more I have in me. And I really want to make the most of every opportunity I get. So it's a privilege to stand before you and seek by God's grace to speak something into your life that will help you. Scott Mamaday is a Kiowa Indian. He is a professor of literature at a college in California. When he was a boy, his father awoke him gently one morning and said, I want you to get up and go with me. His father walked with him hand in hand and led the sleepy boy to the house of an elder woman of the tribe. His father told him that he would return at, uh, in the evening and bring him home. All day long, the old woman of the Kiowa tribe told stories to the boy, sang songs to him, described rituals, and chanted the history of the Kiowa people. How they began out of a hollow log in the Yellowstone River, of the migration southward. She told him of wars with other tribes and the great blizzards and the buffalo hunts and the coming of the white man and the clash and the war and moving southward into Kansas about deprivation and starvation, a diminished tribe, and finally Fort Sill, reservation and confinement. When it was almost dark, his father came and said, son, it's time to go home. Mama Day said, I left her house, a Kiowa. I left her house, a Kiowa. That got into my mind and started jumping around. I left her house, a Kiowa. When I look at you, I hope there were stories to tell about grandpa and grandma and their faith. And there was the testimony of the rock solid walk of your parents and thrilling things remembered in Mrs. Smith's and Mr. Jones Sunday school class and a youth minister that you're very sure God handpicked for you, and a couple of youth sponsors who loved you as their own child. And CIY trips, and all of that led you to love Jesus and believe in Jesus. And you said, I left my house a Christian. And looking ahead to four years or so of classes, writing papers, book reports, internships, institutes, dorm devos, late night crying sessions with a friend, one-on-one -on -one with professors, mentors, chapel services, hearing stories and testimonies of those who have gone before you, that you will say, when your folks come to pick you up and take you home, I left Nebraska Christian, a church leader. I was looking through a very old sermon file, and I found a message that I had preached about 50 years ago at a revival in my home church when I was a fourth-year student at Ozark. It brought back some special memories. 
The title of the sermon was The Failure of the Almost. The message was topical and had as its basis an obscure text in Judges. It was about a woman, a concubine, who was sent out into the night to try and satisfy the animal-like perverted lusts of a bunch of men. And it says they abused her all night. Judges 19, 26 says, And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. And her master rose up in the morning, and when he opened the door of the house and went out to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hand on the threshold. I'm 22 years old and I am preaching a revival in my home church. I'm learning how hopefully to preach a little bit better each time and I have such a fire in my belly so from this text This horrific story, a subject cried out to me in my young days that needed to be preached, the failure of the almost. Was the sermon a homiletical masterpiece? Boy, it was not, and it still isn't today. But when I preached it that night, with a sense of urgency and great passion, four people, four people came down the aisle to Christ that night and accepted him as Lord and Savior and were baptized. So, I'm asking your permission this morning to preach some of that message to you. Why? Because what a loss, what a tragedy it would be after all of our living, the epitaph of our life would be almost, almost. Because of these emotions, will you allow me to remember 50 years ago When every time we preached, we expected someone to come to Christ, and we could hardly believe it when they didn't. When we offered an invitation at the close of the message, there was often tears in our eyes and urgency in our voice and hope in our hearts, and often we would say things like, I know there are people out there tonight who are struggling who are wrestling in the depths of their soul trying to figure out what to do with Jesus. Oh, could we just sing one more verse, church? Could we just sing one more verse? And there were people out there who maybe had attended every service of the revival and you knew they needed Christ. Maybe you'd even called on them earlier in the day so you would sing and the people would join with hope in their hearts, wives for a lost husband, parents for lost children, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. The woman was fallen down with her hands on the threshold. There's no such thing as an ounce weighing a ton. There's no such thing as one shingle being an entire roof. A pint could never have the capacity of a reservoir, nor one letter the power of the alphabet. One link can never make a chain, nor one brick a wall. But there is such a thing as distance or nearness being distance as closeness being far away. The poor woman was there 
almost she was inside where there was warmth and protection, but she died in the night with her hand on the threshold. A minister had traveled a distance from his home to preach a funeral. On his way back, in fact, very close to home, he had an accident and was killed. When his wife looked down upon the dead body of her husband, she said, you were almost home, darling. The failure of the almost. We see it in lots of places. In sports, a shot here, an error there, a bad call, so close. A golfer named Keith, uh, Kevin Sutherland the other day had an eight-foot putt lip out for a 58. No one has ever done that in golf. One time during a basketball game in junior high, it was right before the end of the half, we had the ball on the other side of the half court. They threw the ball into me, and I let it fly with everything I had and it sailed through the air, and it hit the net dead center. It was the sweetest swish you ever saw. The crowd went wild. I didn't know what to do. I stood there. I could feel my face getting hot and red. I was embarrassed, and then I noticed the referee walking toward me, and I thought, he's coming to congratulate me too. But he said, son, I'm sorry. Your shot doesn't count. The buzzer was already sounding when you put it in the air. And I felt the hurt and the disappointment of almost. On November 11th, 1918, Gordon Gillespie was killed one hour before the war ended. My cousin, Dennis, one of the sweetest, most gentle souls that God ever made, was killed in Vietnam three days before his tour of duty was over. Oh, how I wept when I saw his name on the Vietnam Memorial. There are other things that I remember that were almost. I went to call on a man and his wife who had been visiting our church. We had a great visit, and he told me that, preacher, soon, when I get some things in order, I'm going to call you, and maybe you could baptize me. Of course, I said, there's no time like the present, uh, sir, there's no better time than now to accept Jesus as Lord. And and be immersed into him. He said, no, I have to take care of some things. It won't be too long. As I was leaving, he told me, I'd like to have you come down sometime, preacher. I'd like to take you up on this big hill behind my farm and show you this beautiful, beautiful vista. He said, I'm in perfect health. Oh, I've got a little problem with one of my legs. and This hurts a little bit once in a while, but I'm in perfect health. Kids, my phone awakened me the next morning, and it was that man's wife telling me that he was dead. <clears throat> when you're out there in the ministry preaching, you find people that they just really do something to you and for you, and you just love them. And we, my first ministry in Wisconsin, there was this old gentleman named Walt Ewing. Always had about a two, three-day growth of beard. Was a farmer. Loved to fish. Wasn't a Christian. I went out to see him, visit him, cordial. Everything was nice. I said. 
we got to talking about fishing, and so I said, why don't I come and get you sometime? We'll go down on the Wisconsin River and fish. Oh, he would like that a lot. So we set a time, and I went and got him and took him to the Wisconsin River, and we went fishing, caught quite a few fish, had a great day. But that old thing's inside me stirring. You got to say something, Dave. You got to say something to Walt. You got to break the spiritual ground a little bit with Walt, David. And so we're on our way home, had a great day, and I said, uh, Walt, what are you going to have, Walt, at the end of your life if you don't have Jesus? And he started crying, big old crocodile tears. And uh, I thought, you know, man, this, this is great, but Walt wouldn't move. He cried, but he wouldn't move. He cried, but he wouldn't say yes. He cried, but it put me off. A telephone call one day, and a distraught, almost hysterical woman was on the other end of the line saying that the doctor just called her and told her that her dad, Walt Ewing, had about five months to live. You know what I did? I put the phone down, and I got in my little Buick Skylark, and I drove 10 miles north out in the country where his farm was, and I went right up to him, and I started again again about, Walt, what you're going to have at the end of your life if you don't have Jesus. And I begged and I pleaded with Walt Ewing to come to Christ, and he would not move. He cried, but he wouldn't move. He cried, but he wouldn't say yes. And I tried everything I knew as a young preacher. Just... Almost to the day, five months later, the phone rang again. Walt Ewing's dead. I got in my Skylark again, and I drove 10 miles north out into the country, and I walked in his room, or in his house, and there, sitting in a chair with an army blanket thrown over him, was Walt Ewing. Young people, that created a sense of urgency in me that has never never subsided and how much this world needs Jesus and how hard it is and it's warfare and you've got to be prepared when you go to battle one day a young man came running up to Jesus in Mark 10 and asked what must I do to inherit eternal life you know the commandments. Sure, I know them. I've kept them all when I, uh, since I was just young. And you know, in, instead of Jesus saying, sure you have, <laughs> sure you have, it says he looked at him and loved him and told him he still lacked one thing. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now, now, one shingle would finish the roof. One link would make the chain strong enough to pull any load. One letter would finish the story. One brick would make a great wall so close so close, but he went away arguing, not saying, Jesus, you expect too much. He went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Were we to have a conversation, something like that, with Christ this morning, what one thing do you suppose he would ask of you? What one thing?
Now, unless you think this sermon is pointless, I have a couple that I want to share with you as I bring it to an end. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I don't know how there could be a better text for Bible college students than that. Seek the Lord while he is near. Call upon him while he may be found. I came so close to missing him. Then walking away from him, the nearness of God frightened me my first year at Ozark. I ran away and I ran into so many other things. How close has he come to you? How many beautiful things has he placed within your reach? I've noticed in my 10 years here how that happens to so many. Over these 10 years, students have preached things and said things and done things that blow me away. And I stand before you amazed and so richly blessed. A precious memory comes to mind one day in chapel when a young man had finished his senior sermon. When he finished, he walked back to where his family was seated. It was in the lecture hall. His father reached out to him, and I was standing where I could see that the father was very emotional. In his emotion and all that he was feeling, he had to express himself, but he wanted to show some restraint and not embarrass anybody, especially his son. Well, this is what I saw. He grabbed his son's hand and kissed it. In his emotion, all that that proud father wanted to say and express to his son, he brought up his hand and kissed it. God was near. God was sought. God was found. And I was never so pleased that I got to do what I do as I was that moment. I love to hear Bill Hybels tell about Acts class. His professor was a Greek. And Hybels says that he would stand before the class after teaching and applying Acts 2.42 through 47 and Acts 432 through 37, he would say, students, this could happen again. Students, this must happen again. Students, this will happen again if one of you will lay down your life for the sake of the gospel. And Bill Heibel says that he would break down in class, and as soon as it was, it was over, he would run out and get in his Volkswagen and put his head on the steering wheel and weep. I was going to say some things here like, um, what if he had played video games most of the night? and had decided to slip in, uh, sleep in and skip class? Or what if he was playing a game on his computer or texting a friend? On that day when God came near and gave him a vision of a church like Willow Creek, what if instead of the way it is, it was almost? I was going to say that, but I decided not to because I didn't want you to think I was old and grumpy. <laughs> so I decided to leave that out of the message. <laughs> but I can't help but wonder what if 
and how many things I have missed because I was preoccupied with lesser things. The second point is Revelation 3.20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and will eat with him and he with me. Few things in Scripture sound better than that. We have the power to allow him in or keep him out. Notice it doesn't say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and when you get everything in order, open it and I will come in. Or when you have this much faith, or, or when you're being this good, I was deficient in all those things the day I opened the door. He just says, if you can hear me and will open the door, I will come in. And of course, in that same 10 years, I have seen precious, beautiful young people choose other things when God came near with his hands full of blessings. And Jesus stood gently at the door of their heart and knocked, but he was never allowed to fully come in. A minister was asked by a woman he knew to call on her father who was in the hospital. He went, and after a little small talk, the minister made mention of a chair that was pulled up right beside the man's bed. He asked if he had had a visitor, and the man said, no, no. You see, that chair is for Jesus, because I believe that Jesus is so real that you could invite him right in and have him sit down in the chair and talk to him just like we're talking. The minister was moved by that. He ran into the woman a few days later and asked concerning her father, and the woman said, Daddy died. She said that he was doing so well one afternoon, they felt they could go away for a couple hours, but while they were gone, he died. And she said there was something a little bit curious. Well, they found my father with his head in a chair that was by his bed. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And one day, when life is ebbing away, you can lean over and fall asleep in the arms of Jesus. The other day, I overheard a student say in response to what causes you your greatest concern, and the student answered, and I hope he doesn't get mad at me for, for quoting him, that I might settle for living a mediocre life. was his answer. I broke into the biggest smile and it was all I could do to keep from running over and tackling that kid. <laughs> his answer thrilled me so much because it's one of my greatest fears for you. God is holding out all things that lead to excellence and that you might settle for mediocrity. Young people, the Lion of Judah is roaring. He wants you to go impact the world. How tragic. How tragic if any of us looking back on our life would have to say, almost, 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 I was a Kiowa. 
Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for these precious, wonderful kids. Help them to see all that you have in store for them. Even though at times it might be hard and difficult, if they will put everything, they're all in you and not settle for almost or being close, but let Jesus carry them all the way to the end. I thank you in his precious name. Amen.